Welcome to the third event in this year's Energy Symposium series, Critical Issues in Energy. Today's topic is exciting. It's on mitigating natural gas flaring. I'm Ramanand Krishnamurti, the Chief Energy Officer here at the University of Houston, um, the, the Energy University. We have an outstanding panel and moderator today, and I'd like to thank uh, Susan, um, uh, Jennifer, Colin, and Christine for their participation today. I'd like to recognize the President's Energy Advisory Board. The board is made of industry experts and leaders who give UH and UH Energy strategic guidance to advance energy education and research. I'd also like to thank the other UH faculty energy fellows um, uh, who also contribute to the symposia, as well as to other UH Energy programs and events throughout the year. A few quick, quick notes about today's event. Um, we are currently live streaming. Uh, uh, an archive video of the panel will be available on our YouTube page next week. We encourage you to submit questions through for our panel throughout the event via our link. The link is uh.edu slash energy slash ask. Uh, the link will appear periodically, so you don't have to memorize that um, and will be on the screen. Uh, and you can also find it on uh, the live stream page. There has been uh, there have been a couple of questions about uh, PDHs. Uh, for anybody who wants uh, professional development hour credit, please do email me ramanan at uh.edu, and we'll make sure that we we take uh, care of that. So, without further delay, let's get started with the panel today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Christine Elig Economides, um, professor of petroleum engineering. Uh, and uh, the Hugh Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen Distinguished University Chair. Uh, she's, uh, she has had an amazing career uh, uh, at Schlumberger initially, where she worked for about 20 years, uh, followed by, she came to University of Houston uh, and then went to Texas A&M University where she uh, was for 10 years, a faculty member in the Petroleum Engineering Program. Uh, uh, while at a and she managed a very strong research program in production and uh, reservoir engineering in conventional and shale reservoirs, uh, and really helped uh, grow that uh, in petroleum engineering department uh, to a much broader uh, energy portfolio. Uh, Dr. Economides was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2003 and was a member of the uh, National Academy of Sciences Committee on America's Energy Future and the NRC Board on energy and environmental systems. Uh, most interestingly, she recently chaired uh, the uh, Academies of Medicine, Engineering and Science in Texas uh, Shale Task Force in 2017. And for those of you interested, uh, she also uh, moderated a, a, a fantastic energy symposium on that issue uh, of the Shale Task Force report uh, that really identified six axes of challenges uh, and, and possible opportunities and, and ways to solve a lot of those challenges uh, uh, about th three years ago. She's an honorary member of the Society of Petroleum Engineer Engineers uh, and uh, got that uh, and was conferred that honor in 2018. Uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Economides. Uh, so I just want to make a couple remarks uh, before we get started um, to help bring everybody on the same page. Um, uh, we've had some very interesting drama uh, for Texas in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it, it may be related uh, in some peripheral ways to what we talk about today. Um, but just a few brags um, regarding Texas natural gas. Uh, we produce on average more than 22 BCF per day in Texas uh, and uh, about five BCF per day we export to Mexico and is LNG. Uh, about 36% of the gas produced in Texas actually is produced with oil in uh, Permian Basin, Eagle Ford uh, and the like. So um, that's different. That's what we call associated gas. And uh, the remainder of the gas produced in Texas is non-associated gas. Uh, and the difference is that non-associated gas comes from reservoirs that contain only gas. Uh, but the associated gas comes with the oil. 
And so uh, our subject today is flaring and uh, most of the flaring really has to do with uh, gas that's produced with oil. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that the natural gas produced with the oil has um, far more BTU than the oil. Uh, so it is of secondary interest to oil producers, whereas non-associated gas, that is your product. So it is of primary interest. Uh, so uh, we might be very worried about flaring in Texas because there are satellite pictures that, that show these flares as, as lighting up uh, the landscape. But in actual fact, we will learn from our panelists uh, that Texas flares typically only about 4% of uh, the associated gas from oil. Um, and uh, it can reach up to 0.6 BCF per day. But again, uh, overall, our gas production is 22 BCF per day. So this is a small fraction. Um, on the right, we can see what natural gas is doing for us in winter and summer. So it represents more than 50% of the electric power generation in the summer. Uh, and it also supports our industry. Uh, and we can see that commercial and residential users also have a, a piece of this uh, natural gas pie. So one more slide and then I'm gonna uh, introduce our panelists. Um, so here um, we're speaking about flaring versus venting. So when we flare, uh, that's when you see a big flame over um, the uh, flare. Uh, and so we are burning um, mainly natural gas um, and it's, it's noisy, it's very visible. So if you live near these flares, you, you see them, you know them. Uh, and uh, venting in contrast, that's if we don't burn the produced gas and we just let it go into the atmosphere. That's what we call venting. Uh, and most of this associated gas is methane. Um, methane has no odor. When it's vented, it's not making any noise. Uh, we can't see it. Um, and um, it isn't normal that it's vented. Uh, that's what our panelists are gonna help you understand. Uh, so uh, flaring is occasional and is controlled. Uh, and the operators mean that to happen. Uh, venting is more inadvertent. Uh, um, so flaring is emitting carbon dioxide because that's what happens when you burn methane, but venting uh, is actually the methane. Uh, both carbon dioxide and methane, methane are greenhouse gases, but uh, methane actually is uh, of much more risk for uh, potential climate change effects because it has a hundred times more uh, global warming potential or up to a hundred times more uh, than that of carbon dioxide. Uh, so I'm hoping that these remarks will help you um, put in context what our speakers are uh, going to be telling us. Uh, so with that, let me uh, say a few words about who are our speakers. So Jennifer Stewart uh, will be talking about what our uh, Permian operators have been learning uh, in, in the flaring um, uh, direction. And uh, Jennifer is Vice President for Strategic Growth uh, in Avitas, which is a Baker Hughes venture. Um, and um, she's, uh, it, it, and uh, Avitas is a subsidiary that's been providing drone and ground-based methane detection systems and emissions management uh, data analytics solutions. Um, there's a few more things I could say, but I think these have been also posted on our uh, website. Uh, and uh, I think I'll go on to just make a few remarks also about uh, our second speaker, who is uh, Dr. Susan Stuver. Uh, she's with the Gas Technology Institute, and she's a research and development manager. 
Uh, she's leading the GTI Environmental Risk and Integrity Management Systems um, that's directing the planning acquisition development and technical execution of environmental programs throughout the US and overseas. Um, so she's going to go into more detail about uh, emissions measurement and how we can uh, mitigate these. Uh, and I think with a particular focus on, again, the methane. Uh, so I've tried to explain to you why uh, methane should be a focus uh, in this discussion. And then finally, our third speaker is Colin Layden. Uh, he's with the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, he's the Director of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs. And I think we're going to look to Colin for um, maybe questions related to policy uh, and also some additional remarks about uh, the um, nature of the emissions. Um, so I think with that, uh, we're about ready to start with our first panelist, which will be uh, Jennifer Stewart. Uh, and I think we'll bring up uh, her first uh, presentation slide. And Jennifer, I hope you're ready to take over. Thank you very much, Dr. Ailey Economides. And thank you all for, for being here today. I'm very happy to be here today. One thing that that I don't think was in my bio or addressed is, or maybe it was, is that I'm a, a U of H Law Center alum. So, and I currently teach as an adjunct there as well. So I hope I'm representing my, my cougar red appropriately. Uh, if we could go to the tee up the, the, the first slide of the presentation. So in my in prior last year, I worked for another area of, of Baker Hughes, which was a, um, a methane management consulting area. And in my role there, we con uh, worked with the Environmental Defense Fund to conduct a study on best practices in the Permian with respect to flaring. And so how that came about was the Texas Railroad Commission put out a report that showed the flaring intensity of the, of the operators in Texas, kind of like the best 20 and the worst 20. And we were curious, both myself and my colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund, what made uh, these top tier operators top tier with respect to flaring intensity? What was driving that? Very curious to find out find out what that was all about. So that report was issued last summer and it's the content that's in it is, is still valid today. So I encourage you to, to take a look at it when you get a chance. So my discussion will be a high level view of that report. So next slide. This is uh, this is a, a view. So what's the big deal? And, and, and Dr. Ilig Economy just set it up very well. She made a very good point about flaring versus venting. This is an actual picture. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual site in the Permian. This is a mock-up that we have for, for Avitas, the sky technology that does methane inspection and uses back-end data analytics to provide location and quantification of emissions. So on the right, you see a flare stack and that was taken with a, a, a drone and an RGB camera. And you look at that and you're like, hey, you know, looks fine. Um, don't see anything wrong. I can't see anything. I can't smell anything. I can't hear anything. So there must not be a problem. But the left using the OGI camera tells you there's a problem, tells you that you have an unlit flare stack that is directly emitting 100% methane or almost 100% methane into the air. Flares are assumed to have a 98% combustion efficiency, meaning that they burn off 98% of the methane and only 2% goes into the air. But an unlit flare is uh, emitting almost, has zero combustion efficiency is, and is almost emitting 100% methane. So that kind of, I, I love these, this picture because I think it sets up just the, the, the discussion, the rest of the discussion today with Dr. Stuber and Colin. So there, so we had some quantitative data and the quantitative data, as you see, is this is, uh, the numbers on this bar chart is flaring intensity. It is meaning the amount of gas that was flared over the amount of gas produced or, or the amount of oil produced, depending on, on how there's some, there's some just some discussion on how flaring intensity should be looked at. But for that, this is the, this is the average flaring intensity for each of these companies 
Compared to the average flaring rate in the Permian of 3.7%, we saw that these companies were heads and shoulders above their peers. And Parsley is, is a little different. Parsley now, of course, has merged with Pioneer, but I will dive back into to Parsley a little bit closer at, as we go along with the discussion. And, and oh, by the way, Pioneer and Parsley merged and it made perfect sense because they are both uh, great environmental stewards in what they were doing. So this was one element of that, that prompted the study. The other element that prompted the study, and Colin, I'm assuming <clears throat> you will address this, is the EDF Permian Methane uh, Analysis Project Permian map that did a flyover of the Permian and found that 11% um, of the flares in the Permian were either malfunctioning or completely unlit as the picture that we saw yesterday or, or just the slide that I just showed you. And then there was a peer reviewed study uh, using the Tropomi satellite that, that concluded that uh, emissions were possibly 60% higher than the most recent bottoms up surveys. And they also attributed that to unlit or malfunctioning flares. So more to, more to come on that, I think with the rest of my speakers. So with this data and with the, the Tropomi study and the Permian map study prompted the question of how are these producers achieving these results? In this, in this study and the discussion, and by the way, I, um, they're not on here today, but we, I wanted to thank those five producers <clears throat> because they were very transparent and very willing to share, share a lot of information that uh, was maybe awkward for them at times or, or uncomfortable, but without their, without their contributions and cooperation, the study would not have been possible. So the data gathering process had a lot of questions. And we came into it, the Enviro Defense Fund and myself, when we were staging the questions of what's your silver bullet? What is the, what is the magic new technology that you're using for handling associated gas? Is it microscale LNG? Is it CNG? Is it using uh, uh, on-site power generation? Is it enhanced oil recovery and injecting the gas to, you know, to, for EOR? What's your silver bullet? And as we came, as the discussions iterated and, and I talked to these five producers, three themes emerged. And we're going to talk about those three themes in the rest of the discussion. The first was governance and environmental stewardship. All of these companies had, had strong governance from the board all the way down to the field. And so what that means is when a busy field operator, a pumper is out doing their rounds and they have a responsibility to, to inspect the production facilities and they have, an, they have a responsibility to see is a flare unlit? Is it malfunctioning? Is, is, do I hear or see something that may be amiss? They have a decision to make. They can ignore it because they're under time pressure and cost pressure or they can address it and report it and do the right thing. And the the culture from the board of directors all the way down to the field influences that pumper's behavior. So that's an example of what I mean by governance and environmental stewardship. <clears throat> the first thing that these companies did was share practices, best practices with other producers. And this is, can be in trade, state trade associations, federal trade associations, uh, organizations like APIs, environmental partnership, uh, the One Future organization that is really geared more toward dry gas, but these are trade associations and organizations, the Texas Flaring Coalition, I'm, Colin may talk about that as well, that are addressed at sharing ideas and, and resources on how do we reduce flaring. The next best practice was establishing cross-functional working committees, and this means the, the, the solutions weren't just tied to the, the HSE department or the regulatory department or operations or the sustainability folks. It was across all these functions and they worked together to, for, for ideation, to come up with solutions, to do after action reviews. Another best practice, which is a combination of some of the items in here is sharing, publicly sharing with, with your employees and with external stakeholders that you have flaring targets and what are your what is your progress against those flaring targets? And I love the example of the of the um, CEO of Pioneer, Scott Sheffield, who publicly said on an investor relations call 
that if if a producer in the Permian has a flaring intensity of anything higher than 2%, you should not invest in them. And those are pretty uh, harsh words coming from the CEO of a, of a Permian producer, but he put a stake in the ground and has committed to putting that stake in the ground. Making uh, flaring intensity data and transparent to employees. And so what I mean by this is that the, some these companies use different ways to approach it, but they would share, here's our goal and here's our progress. And, and they would do it either quarterly on town halls or some even had to the extent they could tie it into their SCADA systems, real time. Here's what, here's how we're, here's our flaring efficiency on a real time basis. And you can look at that whenever you want. Now, finally, there's two of the most important uh, elements of all these. And one is setting an aggressive flare intensity goal. And that can take different goals for different producers. And so the five producers that were part of this study approached it different ways. Some set absolute reduction targets. Some set year over year improvements. Some made public statements uh, on what they think the appropriate level of flaring intensity was. So not one size fits all, but when the companies made an aggressive public flaring intensity goal, that created accountability. Again, from the board of directors all the way down to the, to the field employees. And then finally, these companies tied compensation, compensation metrics into those flaring performance goals. If there's anything that is going to incent uh, a business, it's to tie compensation to a goal. Compensation metrics drive accountability. And this really shows accountability on the count of these companies. What is the silver bullet? The silver bullet is to not sell your associated gas, not flare, is to, I'm sorry, is to sell your associated gas. The silver bullet is to not flare it, it's to sell it. That's what, that's what the discussions concluded at the end of the day. Each of these companies made a strategic leadership decision that all gas, no gas was going to be flared if at all possible and gas lines had to be connected before a well went to sales. So there was, a, there was a demonstrated commitment that we will not place a well to sales unless we have takeaway for our gas. And there was even to the extent that there was a willingness to shut in a well if the infrastructure was not in place. Now that's, if anyone, I worked for a producer for a very long time and if you were an operator and you had to tell your boss, hey, I don't have takeaway, so we need to shut this well in. I don't think you'd have your job very long. So that usually didn't happen. But these companies made that commitment. We will not put a well online until we have takeaway in place. And so I think I've said that four times. I can't say it enough. Secondly, takeaway was perceived as a barrier, not a barrier, but a constraint. And so the difference is, as we, as I researched for this study, some producers, uh, what you'll read a lot is, well, we have to flare in the premium because we don't have takeaway. It's a, it's a barrier. There's full stop. We can't have any more discussion. These companies approach this as a constraint. And the good example was like permitting. I can't drill a well. I can't build a lease road unless I have a permit to do that. So is that a barrier or constraint? No, it's a constraint that you work around and you make and you work with your team and you work with external stakeholders to make sure you have those permits in place. But then how do you get the takeaway? So that's not an easy answer. There's two ways to do that. There's forming strategic long-term partnerships with midstream companies that can do your takeaway and your gas processing, or it's uh, an integrated business model where the companies invest themselves in processing and gathering. So there's two different ways to look at it, depending on the profile of the company and the investment tolerance. There's a lot of factors that go into it and it's very complicated and it's very complex, but it's doable and you can see by these companies it's being done. Next slide. <clears throat> and then the next slide, and I, we will talk about this a little bit more and I think uh, maybe Dr. Stuver or Colin will discuss it. There's, there's routine flaring of associated gas and then there's non-routine flaring in the case of operational upsets, high gas line pressures or safety reasons. This is where you have to flare. So these companies addressed when they have to flare, they made sure that the flaring, pro that all along the value chain, 
that they were doing the, all they could to reduce emissions. And that included frequent, frequent inspection using boots on the ground, using people, using o, you know, AVO, audio, visual, olfactory, your eyes and ears to see what's going on. They found that interestingly enough as one of the most operationally efficient and cost-effective ways to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to measure the efficiency of what they were doing. Now, as a as a um, as a person who's who has a continuous monitoring solution, you know there may be discussions a, a, a another day on another topic. But for now, this is how they approached it: a proactive, uh, strategic approach to managing operational upsets. Another excuse that I heard was, "Well, we have operational upsets, so we have to flare." Well, these companies said, "No, that's not the right approach." We're going to work with our midstream, uh, with our gathering and processing partners. We're going to work with if it's midstream is within. We're going to midstream is within our company. We're going to work with them, and we're going to be proactive and strategic on these operational upsets. We're not going to let them be an excuse to flare. We are going to manage them, and then finally, uh, the use of vapor recovery units, if on the majority, if not all, pad sites to to maximize emissions capture efficiency and. And one in particular was, was Pioneer, where they have committed to using 100% uh, vapor recovery units on all of their sites, uh, no matter whether it was cost efficient or not to do that, do so. And I thought that was uh, extremely, um, ex just very impactful. There was in, in the report, there's a, there's a list of probably 10 or different ways of, of, how, of how companies mitigated their, their emissions in various ways too many details to go into here. And, and um, the report is available on Environmental Defense Fund site, Baker Institute, or on my LinkedIn report. So you're happy to look at that. Finally, uh, in, our, in our last slide, beyond operational and environmental factors, what else was driving these companies to act and, or to have this, this incredible flaring efficiency numbers? And it's three, it's the financial statement impact. If you're selling the gas, you're protect, you're adding to the bottom line and you're protecting cash flows. And particularly in the Permian, this is high BTU gas, a liquid rich gas that commands a premium over pure dry gas. Risk mitigation. Uh, these companies want to be seen as in it for the long term. They want to keep their social license to operate and they want investors to be that with them in the long term. And investors are seeing climate risk as investment risk. So they're trying to mitigate that risk. And then finally, access to capital markets. If you have a good environmental stewardship, not only just story, but you're proving it in your results, it makes it easier to access the capital markets with respect to uh, issuing equity, issuing debt, or it may even make your stock more valuable at the end of the day. So that concludes my report and thank you very much for your time. So oh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. And uh, I think what we're going to do is uh, go straight to our next speaker. And uh, I hope that uh, we're getting uh, questions coming in uh, and we'll address those after all three speakers. Uh, so let's uh, turn this over to Susan Stuber. Dr. Dr. Stuber, we're ready for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Stuber. I'm with uh, GTI. I'm the Research and Development Manager for the Gas Delivery Group. I won't spend too much time on GTI, but just to give you a little bit of context, we are an independent not-for-profit. We were established by the natural gas industry about 75 years ago to tackle some of the tough energy challenges related to technology, innovation, and integration. And this goes all the way from downhole, like um, when you're drilling, all the way through the value chain to the burner tip. And in addition to R&D, we also manage large collaboratives. We provide analytical lab services. We do a little bit of consulting where it makes sense, and we have a robust training program. Uh, and for the technologies that we invent, we can also commercialize. We have about 400 plus employees and um, pretty excited. We were voted one of the top places to work in 2019 as well as 2020. So it's a fantastic group of people and tons of interesting work. Okay, so this slide shows what you might encounter in terms of emissions at an oil and gas production facility besides flares. I'll come back another day and talk for like seven hours about the rest, but for today, I'm just going to talk about one of the biggest sources of emissions at a production facility, which are primarily tanks. In an oil production site, 
Tanks are used to hold oil for brief periods of time in order to stabilize the flow of oil from um, the well to the pipeline or uh, to trucking sites. And then there's also condensate, which are liquids that are contained in the produced gas. They're also stored in a tank as well. And those are called condensate tanks. And the gases in these tanks will, they'll vaporize or what we call flash. So you might hear people talk about tank flashes. And that's when the liquid um, uh, collects in the space between the liquid itself and the roof of the tank. And as the liquid level in the tank starts to fluctuate, these vapors are often vented to the atmosphere unless there's a vapor recovery unit that can either capture the gas and send it directly to the pipeline or can send it to a containment uh, or the gases <clears throat> will go to a flare. <clears throat> and these flares, like Jennifer mentioned, they're designed to take gas and burn it off to avoid venting and flares should combust 98% of all the methane. However, if a flare is not designed quite properly for the amount of gas it's taking, it may not fully combust all the methane. So the combustion efficiency of that flare goes down and flares don't stay lit all the time. So they're supposed to auto light when gas goes to them. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And also sometimes the vapor recovery units, the actual pieces of equipment on the tanks aren't necessarily working right. Um, or the hatches on the top of the tank uh, aren't latched properly and they'll put out a lot of emissions into the air in a very short amount of time. So there are five ways to get at emissions. You can detect, you can localize, you can quantify, you can mitigate, you can abate. Detection, localization, and quantification tell you what the problem is, and mitigation and abatement are forms of a solution. For example, uh, an instrument that's designed to only detect emissions can't tell you whether the methane is seeing, the methane that it's seeing is actually coming from a tank, a flare, a compressor, a cow, or whether it's a, a permitted venting or whether some kind of maintenance might've been going on that day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, it can only tell you that there's emissions being seen. So if you're someone like EDF and you're looking for a regional emission estimate over a basin, this type of instrument might make sense for your purposes. But if you're an oil and gas operator and you're charged with finding the source of the emissions so that you can fix it, you may need an instrument that can both detect and localize that source of that emission. And we can't measure everything all the time. So in order to calculate basin-wide or nationwide emissions uh, and provide these estimates from industries like oil and gas or agriculture or other sectors, we have to um, estimate what emissions are out there. And in order to estimate emissions, we develop something we call emission factors. And those emission factors are developed by understanding the rate at which an intended or an unintended emission is released. And that's called quantification. And it's a whole different kind of measurement and one that requires really a component by component sampling effort. So once you, once you get to mitigation and abatement, what you need to do is in mitigation, you're basically going to fix it if it's an unintended emission, or if it's abatement, you're gonna actually abate the emission at the source by installing a technology or changing your operations in such a way where you dramatically reduce or even eliminate the risk of emissions altogether. Okay, so let's take a couple of examples here. In the realm of detection and localization, technologies are really rapidly growing in complexity. In fact, we use an entire ecosystem of technologies to find a leak. Um, it could be several types of integrated methane sensors, could include a GPS unit, can include a meteorological station, plus it's gonna have advanced real-time analytical processing software. And by the way, it's all mounted into a helicopter. So finding the best technology for the job is gonna depend on a lot of things. An excellent sensor could be deployed in a way that's really unsuitable for leak detection and localization, or the instrument system could actually be a little bit too good, meaning that it's just too resource intensive to implement i.e. need a PhD and a drone pilot to operate it, make sense of the data. Uh, and you may not actually need that level of detail. So with that said, if your goal is to determine emissions at specific sites, then you may want to sample for long periods of time and a semi-permanent or permanent mounted sensor may be a jam. Or if your goal is to determine average emissions over a large area, you'll need a platform that can cover a lot of ground like a helicopter or other kinds of aircraft or even a satellite. But 
you really wouldn't want to deploy a helicopter to a small, single, remotely located well that doesn't really have a high probability of leaking. And vice versa, you won't be able to continuously monitor an entire basin. So there's going to be trade-offs and you kind of have to figure out what works best for you in terms of, of monitoring. Okay, so the last slide I'm going to talk about for a little while here is the differences between mitigation and abatement. And of course, I'm going to use flares as an example here. Mitigation, hey, my flare broke, need to fix it. Abatement, hey, my flare keeps breaking, need to replace it with something different, right? So in terms of mitigation, we may think of improving combustion efficiency. And again, EPA requires that flare combustion efficiency be a minimum of 98% destruction of hydrocarbons that are sent to flares. And we can optimize flare combustion efficiency by doing things like changing operating parameters, things like steam to vent gas ratios. We can add supplemental fuels or we can change the fuel to air ratio. However, the ability for flare operators to achieve a high flare combustion efficiency is really, really limited by the lack of live flare efficiency data in order for them to respond to. So if you're heading toward abatement, which Jennifer said most of us are, we're heading toward abatement, we're just, we want to kind of replace flares with something better. You need to figure out one, how you can get that extra gas, and we call it stranded gas, to a pipeline or two, how to take that gas and make power at the site or some other kind of product. And in order to move that extra gas down the line, you have to have infrastructure in place to do it. And many producers don't. And it's very expensive for that to install that uh, type of infrastructure. So some have actually chosen to use the gas for other things. And the tech in this picture to the right is a waste heat to power that uses flare gas. I think that's up in the Bakken uh, in North Dakota. And it's designed to capture gas that would otherwise be flared to generate electricity at the site. And while technologies like this might work pretty well with really large flares that we see up in North Dakota, it has a tendency to not fit really well um, with facilities that have smaller flares. There isn't enough of a steady gas stream or the site doesn't really need that much power. And you run into the same infrastructure issues with selling the power. I mean, how do you move it? Well, you need to install power lines and that gets expensive. So producers are actually getting quite creative with modular technologies or scalable systems, even mobile systems that can move around to different sites. And we can go beyond just producing power with this gas. We could also produce things like methanol, which can produce gasoline. We can produce CNG, which is compressed natural gas or LNG, which is liquefied natural gas. And that makes the investment in the infrastructure a little bit more economically feasible. And that's all I have. So thanks a lot. Look forward to your questions. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Stuber. Uh, we have one more panelist. Uh, this is gonna be from the EDF. Uh, so Colin, please take it away. Great, thanks. Um, really appreciate University of Houston for inviting me today. Um, I've done a couple of things with the university and um, have always been impressed with the quality of the work that gets done at the university. So thanks very much. Uh, I thought I'd start with, um, as uh, I think Jennifer mentioned, we do have a large uh, methane and flaring project out in the Permian Basin that's been running now for about a year and a half and will continue on through 2021. And the real goal of this is to quantify and characterize methane emissions in the basin, including flare performance. Uh, EDF has done a lot of work over the last 10 years in partnership with universities and industry itself in trying to understand more about methane emissions um, domestically and also globally. So a uh, quick overview of the Permian Methane Map Project, and I encourage everyone to visit the website that we put up, permianmap.org. I'll put that in the chat um, once I'm done talking. Um, so we've got three different approaches in trying to uh, get a handle on what's happening in the Permian Basin from methane emission perspective. Um, we are using uh, aircrafts to uh, fly over sites um, in the Delaware Basin. We have a study area, which is about a um, thousand by thousand kilometer area 
that encompasses both Texas and a small portion of New Mexico, the Delaware Basin being um, sort of the hot spot um, in, in increased production, although uh, you could probably say the same about certain portions of the Midland, and we are doing some observations in the Midland subbasin as well. So we have scientific aviation out of Boulder, Colorado that's doing overflights to uh, measure methane emissions. We are working with Penn State University. They've set up um, about five, set up five towers uh, surrounding our study area. Uh, using existing cell phone towers, they've put up um, ambient methane detection monitors um, to try and get a rolling average of ambient methane emission uh, throughout the, the study area over time. And then we um, are using the University of Wyoming to gather ground-based measurements um, that are uh, at, at the site themselves using public roads um, and then taking measurements uh, downwind of the site and coming up with uh, site-specific measurements. And then finally, uh, we are using a company called Leak Surveys Incorporated for our flaring technology, our flaring surveys, and these are not quantitative surveys, they're qualitative surveys. They are flying with an OG, OGI camera, um, looking at flares for flare performance. Um, so real quick, some of our uh, initial findings. Um, the methane emissions in the Permian Basin are very high. Um, Permian methane emissions are about double any other oil and gas producing basin in the US right now, from what we can tell. Um, their wells are about three times leakier than what the EPA inventory estimates say they should be with about a 3.5% methane loss, uh, meaning about 3.5% of the methane um, that is being produced is actually escaping into the atmosphere. That's our initial calculation. There's a satellite company um, out of a group of, of scientists and academics called Tropomi out of the Netherlands that have also done their own estimate, um, taking satellite measurements over the course of, uh, of an entire year, about a thousand different measurements. And they came up with a leak rate for the entire basin of about 3.7%. So we feel pretty confident about what we're seeing out there from, a, from a, an emissions perspective. And then on the flare, I think uh, maybe Jennifer alluded this uh, before. And this, I think, was one of the pieces of, we, we, we went into the project suspecting that methane emissions were high. Um, and we had heard anecdotal evidence about flares being unlit or not burning properly. Um, but I think we were kind of shocked at what we did find on the flares. Um, so we've done four surveys over the course of the year, visiting um, about 300 different flare sites each time throughout both the, the sub basin of the Delaware as well as the Midland Basin. And what we found was, is that about 10% of flares are either unlit or malfunctioning. And within that, within that base uh, performance um, about, thank you for moving that slide, about uh, uh, within that 10%, so 5% five five are completely unlit, meaning they're venting their entire, um, their entire gas uh, is, is being vented directly into the atmosphere. You can see a picture there. We saw one from Jennifer's slides. Um, Obviously, if you were looking with the naked eye, you wouldn't see anything. Um, but with an OGI camera, that black um, that black smoke coming out is is essentially methane. So five percent completely unlit, an additional five percent to six percent um, are malfunctioning in some way, meaning partial combustion. So what does that mean? Um, you know, we've been talking about flaring in, in the U.S. Uh, for several years, um, and we've always and by we, I mean the royal we, not just EDF, but I think it's been a discussion that's primarily focused around waste, which I think is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, why are we wasting when we flare uh, a valuable resource? Um, and, and that's been where the, where the uh, discussion really sort of focused. As, as I think Susan mentioned, the, the, the classic flare is supposed to operate around 98% efficiency. Um, sometimes they, they operate even higher than that, 99.5%, 6%. Um, but the way that they're credited on an efficiency basis by the EPA is 98% efficiency. So what, what, what we've really found is, is that that efficiency rate in the Permian Basin anyway is much lower. Um, much closer to probably about a 93% efficiency. And what that means is, is that flaring 
is a much larger source of methane emissions um, than previously thought. In fact, it bumps flaring up into one of the most significant sources of, flare, of methane emissions, likely somewhere around 10 to 11% of, of methane emissions in the, in the basin itself. Um, we also looked on our fourth flaring survey, we wanted to get a sense of, okay, are we just visiting a flare on a bad moment in time? Because you know, it is a snapshot, the helicopter can't hang out there um, for you know, hovering for multiple days with the camera going. So we wanted to get a sense of, you know, well, maybe how long are these flares being staying unlit, or, or you know, what's the uh, what, what's what what's the persistence of, of these unlit flares? And even though we obviously are under the constraints again of a helicopter, what we found, what we did in the fourth flaring survey, and these surveys last about a week. We went back multiple times to the same flares that were either malfunctioning, being partially lit or completely unlit to, to see if they still were malfunctioning or still unlit. And um, what we saw was is that, you know, roughly half uh, were still malfunctioning to some extent, which, you know, indicates that these flares that are malfunctioning, um, this isn't just a catching them on a bad day. Um, you know, th these are persistent in their emissions. Um, so that's a significant um, flag, I think, that that shows that you know that uh, addressing this issue is, is is really really important. So here's a little bit more, I guess, on the policy side of things. Um, and um, I want to quickly also mention a recent report we did um, in conjunction with um, uh, with Rystad Energy, which is an analytical firm out of Norway, but um, does a lot of work in the U.S. and in, in fact has done a lot of work on flaring over the years. Um, analyzing the data and putting out reports. Um, we have a policy, um, advocacy policy goal here in Texas, uh, Texas of ending zero routine flaring by 2025. The World Bank initiative of zero routine flaring is 2030. Um, I, I will mention that that 2030 goal is set um, by incorporating countries in Northern Africa, the Middle East, where there's really no or very little infrastructure to begin with, uh, as well as diminished or very little regulatory capacity. So we think a 2025 goal is appropriate for Texas, particularly the Permian Basin, which is a 100 year basin with um, certainly some infrastructure challenges, but also um, you know, a long history of, in, of infrastructure and existing infrastructure to work with. Um, so what we did with Rystad was we wanted to look at what the drivers of flaring were, what are the different buckets of flaring, routine versus um, we call it event flaring. Um, sometimes it's called non-routine, which is a broader bucket. Event flaring would be flaring most often driven by midstream issues like a gas plant, a gas processing plant goes down or a gathering and boosting station goes down. And then finally, you know, health and safety flaring. Um, and I'll, I'll, I can talk a little bit about that um, from a percentage basis, but I'll, I'll move on um, to sort of some of our policy goals and some of the known solutions to flaring. Um, we know from what Jennifer said that establishing reduction targets and commitments to prioritizing reducing flaring are important in the corporate context. Those are also important in the regulatory context. And what we are urging the Texas Railroad Commission is to establish some real targets. Zero routine flaring by 2025 would be one. But, but of course, you can't do that overnight. So you know, some, sort of stepping up the targets and adopting some real policy goals that have regulatory power behind them, we think is the key to really putting flaring behind the industry um, for years to come. We do recognize that there are real midstream coordination issues. Um, in the Rystad report, uh, a good 56% of the flaring in 2018 and 2019 was driven by what would be broadly categorized as midstream issues. So, you know, a large percentage was routine flaring. And, and to define routine flaring, I would put it simply as starting your oil production before you have a executable plan for your gas in place. And we've seen a lot of that. Um, and as Jennifer mentioned, you know, most of the companies, all of the companies in, in that report are, are headed towards a goal of not bringing their oil online until they have a destination or a use for that gas um, prior to production. 
So event flaring would be more flaring that occurs um, sort of due to midstream issues. And that's something that needs to be tackled too on the policy side. Uh, I think the solutions there are, might be a little bit more difficult, but there could be a role for regulatory bodies to play on that as well. And then, you know, we have to address this malfunctioning flare issue. Um, there always will be some amount of flaring in the basin um, due to health and safety reasons, unplanned events. Um, and those flares need to operate correctly. There's just no excuse for an unlit flare that is flaring, uh, that is venting for an extended period of time. So we need protocols to monitor flares. I think that there's some, some industry action on trying to figure out um, how to make improvements here. Um, it would be great to see uh, the regulatory bodies of Texas get engaged in that process as well. Um, there's lots of on-site solutions. We hear a lot about, well, can't we use this gas on site to power equipment to, uh, there's companies out there that want to do um, server farms that are powered by the gas. There's produced water management that um, could be done. There's reinjection. So I think, you know, uh, all of these things are excellent, um, but we can't really, uh, we can't really um, rely on this uh, because the economics are backward. And so what the regulatory body needs to do is change the economic incentives. Gas is um, is low priced right now, despite what we saw last week. And no one thinks it's really going to, over the long term, increase greatly in price. And so, as 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 the doc as as our moderator said, there's no in, there's not much incentive if you're there for the liquids for the oil to properly manage this gas um, from an economic perspective. If if it's extremely cheap to flare. And that's what a regulatory body's job is to do, is to tell the operators, you can't flare anymore, or we want you to flare as little as possible, and here are the goals and the targets we're setting up. And that changes the economic incentives. Yes, questions? I guess I'm the last one, so I'll stop there. I will note that flaring has come down um, in the basin since 2018 and 2019. Um, and we can have a discussion about perhaps the causes, whether or not this is a cyclical or a long-term trend, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and, and hand it back to our moderator. All right. So I, I definitely want to start by uh, my thanks to UH Energy for uh, setting us up with this panel and uh, to the people that are in the background that are uh, making it happen. Uh, so we do have some questions. Um, and, you know, I, I think I want to start with one that maybe all three of you could take a stab at. Uh, what do you think would be the cumulative cost mitigating all flaring, and I think all flaring and venting clearly, uh, in the Permian Basin? And, um, if you have an estimate, who, who do you think uh, could pay for this? Does anybody want to start with that, Jennifer? <laughs> oh, you're muted right now. There we go. No, I, I, um, I would not have an estimate. I maybe Colin would be, or yeah, Colin, Doctor Stuber would be I'll, better. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. I mean, I, you know, the Rystad report we did um, mentioned that you know a good chunk of of the Routine flaring is the lowest hanging fruit and really can be done at about, um, I think I had it up on the slide. I think it's somewhat like 84% of routine flaring um, by their estimate can be done at no cost to the operator. There's, you know, the, the one good thing, and this is true about whether you're talking about fugitive methane emissions or whether you're talking about flaring is, you know, you, you do have a product that has some value. Now it may not have as much value as um, you know, the industry would like, but it does have value. And it's one of the reasons and one of the frustrating reasons around methane emissions from oil and gas, why we haven't made as much improvement as we have. And we have made improvements. Um, this is low hanging fruit and the most cost effective way to mitigate on climate that we know of. And it's because that gas has some value. So the Reistad report said that the cumulative um, uh, impacts of, of mitigating routine flaring has an estimated economic value of about $400 million um, through 2025. 
So there is some value here that could be captured. And, you know, I always get the question, well, if there's money to be made, why aren't they doing it? And I, I think there's a sort of a lot of complicated economic issues around that of, of answering that question. But part of it is opportunity cost for operators. Do I spend a million dollars mitigating flaring and methane or do I spend a million dollars to drill a new well? What are my shareholders? What, do, what, what, are, what are the people who I answer to really wanting? So if you recall, when we first started on energy efficiency lighting in industry many years ago, that same question was asked because you would look at the spreadsheet and if you wanted to replace all of your existing lighting with energy efficient lighting, the numbers worked out great, but companies were slow to adopt it. And I think it's you know probably the same set of issues, which is company education, but also priorities. Um, and you know, I think that's that's a big piece of it. And and you know, there's some. It, it doesn't have to do with economics so much, but even if you can prove that you got a means by which you can install this technology, you can capture the gas, you can make some kind of product that ultimately becomes economical for the company. The technologies themselves have, have barriers to integration. Um, you know, they want to install a gas capture technology that makes methanol, that makes gasoline, and then it sends it down the line. And where do you test things like that? So um, there's also delays in kind of movement to action along those fronts as well. But I, I agree with everything Colin said. It's, it's, the, it's kind of the economics model behind it. Um, and it's, it's highly variable depending on what kind of product you have and the, and the type of well you're looking at. Uh, if it's a small well and it's not making a lot of money, then does it really make sense to invest you know, a million dollar infrastructure around it to move that gas, or are we just going to shut it in, right? Um, so that those are those are some tough decisions that the industry is going to have to probably uh, deal with in for situations like this, and they are dealing with it, right? They deal with it every day. Thanks very much. Um, this one was directed to Jennifer, so we might want to let you start, but I think all of you may want to weigh in. Um, so it goes like this, given the current market volatility and conditions, do you think small to mid-sized producers will continue to trade off capital gains against accountability, environmental stewardship, and data transparency, or therefore are regulatory shifts the only solution to encourage all producers to comply and strategically mitigate their methane footprint? Uh, so can we start with you, Jennifer? But I have a feeling uh, both Colin and Susan would uh, address this too. Yeah, and that's a great question. And in part one of my answer would be in the, in the survey that we, the study that we conducted, size didn't matter. The, for example, Parsley at the time was a, probably one of the smaller producers in, in the Permian, as opposed to Chevron or EOG for, uh, for, for that matter. And they didn't have, we actually had this discussion, being small, being a small independent is not an excuse. Look at what we're doing. And, and one thing I didn't point out on the, on, the, on the parsley data was that they had a flaring efficiency of 2.5%. Uh, and that, that was their goal for the year back in, in 2020. They had acquired a company called Jagged Peak that had a 20% flaring efficiency. And when they acquired Jagged Peak, they still said, we're gonna keep our combined flaring efficiency at 2.5. So they, they, a small company bought an even smaller company with a horrible environmental stewardship record, and they still committed to making a difference. So size is, my message is size is not an excuse. Now that being said, all five of these companies were public companies, publicly traded, so they're, you know, they, they have to file with the SEC, they, they have a visible presence, most of the production in the per Permian, I don't have the exact numbers, is not by the big well-named or well-known companies, it's by small privately held independents, either privately held by, uh, by private equity, uh, VC backed firms or family operations. And what are they doing? Well, particularly what we're seeing, and Colin may have a view on this as well, on the private equity backed producers, 
is that the limited partners, the investors are starting to ask a lot of questions. What you know, they see the same risk that the shareholders of Chevron see that environmental risk is investment risk. What are you doing to improve the, the, this portfolio? And I want to see demonstrated results. And even in the even in my in my current role now, where we're employing um, drone based inspection technology and data analytics on a privately backed producer in the Permian. Their investors want to see granular data. They want to see, they don't want it, they don't want greenhouse gas, uh, they don't want EPA DHD factors. They want to see what are your actual emissions and we want to see improvements. So, so in that space, we're starting to see pressure coming uh, coming that way. But I'll I'll toss it over maybe to Colin next for his views on and then also what his views on regulatory pressure <clears throat> may take. Yeah, I have two thoughts on this, and I don't want to abandon regulatory pressure because I think it's extremely important into this conversation. And one of my thoughts, I think, Susan, you can probably answer better, but the first part is, is look, the world is committing more and more to, to net zero carbon by 2050. And um, that, you know, in, that implies, a, you know, a shrinking pie for fossil fuels. But if you look at the IPCC reports from the United Nations, Oil and gas plays a significant role in our energy mix um, over the coming years, but it needs to be as clean as it possibly can be as we as that pie shrinks. Um, now, what we're seeing now is global consumers, and that, you know, Jennifer mentioned the investment community. That pressure in the investment community is only going to increase around these kind of performance issues on emissions. But we're also now seeing it on the global scale with consumers. The European Union right now is considering methane standards for the gas that they purchase. We saw a contract for an LNG, an LNG contract canceled by the government of France um, for a Texas contract citing Permian emissions as being too high, including flaring. Um, and you know, despite the rhetoric um, from, from some against of, of how insignificant that contract may or may not have been, I think it points to a trend, which is as more countries kind of assess their own carbon footprint and their use of fossil fuels, they're going to want to be assured that the fossil fuels that they are using are as clean as possible. And so, you know, no one wants to take business advice from an environmentalist, uh, but you know, if you're Texas and you're looking at what are the what's the future of gas production in this state, I don't think we're building a, an enormous amount of of, of power a gas power plants in in the U.S. There will be some, but it's not a growth sector. The growth sector right now, and I think this has been identified by by the industry itself, is LNG. It's exports, um, and your export market is demanding a cleaner product. And if they don't get it, they're going to get it somewhere else. And then Susan, the second thing I was going to mention is the detection technologies are, are increasing enormously and there's not going to be anywhere to hide. So I'll hand that piece over to you. Yeah, and that's true. And, and I think the industries themselves are getting much better at understanding and using these types of technologies um, and redefining how their work practices are. Uh, so that they can see more emissions and, and, and fix those things. But, you know, we are seeing now, at, at least me personally, more than ever, the industry is starting to come to the table and, and want a place at the table in, in the emissions reduction and decarbonization space. We're seeing a lot of the um, uh, oil, oil, oil and gas super majors and even small producers saying, hey, here's our we want, so we want net zero goals, we want to decarbonize, we want to um, reduce our emissions. Um, I'm part of a project where we're doing a first ever uh, study with Chenier as part of the collaboratory to advance methane science to put um, methane measurement devices on an LNG vessel while it's at sea and in transport. So a part of that comes from that pressure, right? That you talked about from the EU that the industry is like, we really need we're, we're, we're swapping out our LNG uh, vessels, our fleets of ships, but, you know, for, for newer ones, but we don't really understand what our emissions profile is in that space. We've never really uh, been able to go out and, and put these instruments on these uh, vessels uh, for whatever reason. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. We're also seeing a lot of interest in industry. And I don't know, 
it seems like the message is changing a little bit. I'm, I'm seeing more of uh, the industry saying, we want to be part of this new space, this new idea of a decarbonized future, this new renewable future. And we, the industry, want to be part of that solution. And they can be one of our most valuable assets uh, if everybody just starts working together and communicating together. And so I'm seeing a lot of a lot of different messaging in that space rather than just the digging in and fighting back. And, and I think that's good to see. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let's try this one. Um, are the methane emissions in the Permian Basin, uh, how do they compare to other basins? Does anybody wanna take that one on? <laughs> Well, I'll just say real quickly from our research and the Tripomi research that's out there that I mentioned, um, they're very high, um, 3.5 or 3.7%, whichever number you want to pick, is, is a big number um, compared to other basins. Um, it suggests that it, it could be the highest emission basin in the U.S. Anybody else want to touch that one? Um, but it, but it, size matters, right? I mean, it depends on uh, how much oil you're producing, how much the overall magnitude is. But in terms of percent of uh, associated gas, how does uh, Texas do? So if we're talking about flaring, and you know, I and I just flaring and not methane emissions. Um, you, I think you mentioned this before. Compared to some other countries, yeah, the U.S. and the Permian Basin in itself is doing pretty decent from a flaring intensity. But what does that mean, really? And and I think this kind of gets to what is the future on flaring for the industry itself? And is a three percent, a two percent um, flaring intensity is that what we're going to kind of put as our baseline acceptability? I mean, I think if you look at what's happened with methane emissions. The leading companies are now saying 0.25% target on a methane intensity. So I think, I, I believe that on flaring, the same thing needs to happen. I don't know what the perfect number is on flaring intensity for a basin, but I suspect at the end of the day, it's gonna be below 1% um, because we've seen companies achieving that. We've seen companies at the 1% or lower level and so you look at what the leading companies are doing, and I think you can project out from there on what is the future and what it ought to be. Does anybody else want to comment on that uh, on the panel? I agree with Colin. Yeah. Yep. He nailed it. <laughs> so we got a question uh, about vapor recovery units uh, that have been around for a long time, but um, they're not in wide use because of the economics. Um, so this one is pointing directly at carbon tax. Do you think that a carbon tax might be the sort of uh, regulatory answer uh, to, to bring more of this technology into play? Um, well, I think a carbon tax and, uh, you know, there's a pretty broad agreement across multiple industry sectors and policy folks that a carbon tax is a good idea. It is part of Norway's uh, flaring scheme and they've had a lot of success with a carbon tax and how that is integrated into their very restrictive flaring policies. So, um, you know, EDF has always been supportive of a carbon tax as a major tool in the toolbox on tackling climate change. And then I, I don't have a view one way or another on carbon tax, but, but Canada has a, a, a very interesting carbon tax uh, regime where the monies generated from the carbon tax go into an investment fund that is used to finance startup or emerging technologies to reduce emissions. So it's, it's a nice way to take that money and recycle it back into the overall goal of, of reducing emissions. Anything from Dr. Stuber on this one? Um, no, I, I was actually going to mention what's going on in Canada too. I think that's a, I think that's a very um, clever way to um, utilize that that funding in a in a way that that helps. Because I think I think it, it is the the cost of integrating, testing, validating, and and 
uh, ultimately commercializing some of these new technologies that, that tends to slow things down. So if there's additional funding that could be provided for that R&D and technology development, I think that's a really clever model. So here's one for you, I think, uh, to start, Dr. Stuber, uh, Susan. Um, in terms of additional emission, uh, how, how does it compare the methane from the tanks and compressors uh, to flare emissions? So I think we're talking magnitudes here. Where, where's most of the methane likely coming from? Well, and that's a, that's a tough question to answer. As you know, Colin had mentioned that we're not entirely sure um, how much is coming from flares, but we do know that between flares and tanks, that constitutes um, just about half or more of the, um, of the emissions that we're seeing. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to, to mention is that why, and I know folks have come to me and said, you know, why are we still seeing large emissions from things like flares and tanks? Um, and, and I think there's a couple of reasons why this could be happening. And it's first is, is you know, what's being surveyed and the EPA's greenhouse gas reporting program really just includes leak data from wellhead separators, heater treaters, and headers. And it doesn't really include sources like tanks and flares. And that's because they're supposed to be controlled by other regulatory means. So it's possible that um, you know, these larger sources just aren't being surveyed in the same regularity that the other sources are. Uh, and in the other is the instrument that we're surveying. And I know that we've talked about optical gas imagers and um, uh, we've seen some of those great pictures from them, from Colin and, and, and Jennifer. And that camera actually becomes significantly less able to see emissions the farther away from the source you are. And there's also challenges with it seeing leaks from when the background is the sky. So if you're looking up with it and you're looking at a tank or flare that's 30 feet in the air and it's a windy day, it may be hard to see those emissions. And it could actually explain why the optical imagers that are attached to the aircraft are picking up emissions that might be missed by those ground level surveys. And, I, and it almost just seems like that's why these tanks and flares are these really large sources and they've kind of gotten away from us. Um, and, and we haven't really been able to, to see them. And there's also the, the fact that flares just don't light uh, sometimes, right? And uh, you may not catch that until the maintenance because we haven't really went out and inspected it or we're only inspecting quarterly. So I'm gonna follow up with another one to you, Susan, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but this is coming from uh, Gabriel Avgarinos, uh, Energy Monitors at uh, New York University. And he's asking, uh, instead of using expensive helicopters for camera snapshot visual monitoring methane at flare or vent stacks, uh, could, a, could a sampling low cost device be mounted on top of each flare for continuous monitoring and control? And I think you did address that before, but maybe it bears repeating. Yeah, so there's a number of different things you could, you could do with flares. So if you're interested in trying to figure out why a flare lights or doesn't light, um, you could put something like a thermocouple or a flame rod in, inside the flare and it could send data um, to a nerve center and say, hey, hey, flare's not lighting, right? And it's supposed to be. And in fact, in, in a lot of production facilities, this information is there, but it's not collected uh, or, or recorded in a way that can give an operator meaningful data. And so that might not be terribly difficult to do, but the other portion of it is whether or not the flare is actually combusting efficiently, right? And so that's kind of a tougher thing to actually measure uh, on a flare. And in, in terms of continuous monitors, whether you're putting it on a flare or whether you're setting up a, a network of continuous monitors, the, the sensor itself is low cost, but then the cost starts to accelerate with the bandwidth. You have um, maybe a thousand or 10,000 or more of these and they have to package that concentration data and send it. Uh, you have to have edge servers in place. You have to have wireless 
specialized wireless communication, um, long range radio communication. And then you have to have the bandwidth at the, uh, at the control station where the, you actually have operators that are analyzing that data. You have to be able to store that data, handle that data, manage that data. Uh, you're gonna need maybe some type, type of machine learning that's gonna look at the combustion efficiency or whether a you know gas is going to a flare and it didn't light or the gas went to the flare and it did light, but it's not burning efficiently. All of that has to be done with uh, some kind of analytics, right? And that, that's a, that might take a powerful uh, software system and dashboard and, and does a company actually have the resources to do it. And so we call that a neural network with continuous monitors. And that's a lot of times where the rub is um, with those and, and just trying to figure out the uncertainty of the data uh, I know Microsoft is coming along with uh, some really interesting um, solutions in that space and Power BI and, and, and some of these other uh, cool dashboards. But uh, we have a project that we're working on. It's called Project Astra, where an EDF is part of that um, project, along with several operators, okay. at Microsoft mm -hmm. and AT&T, where we are um, trying to get to the bottom of some of those problem so that we can actually deploy some of these continuous monitors in that space. And, and then, uh, so I would be remiss and, and not be not doing my job if I didn't say that, um, that we that we at Baker Hughes offer a solution called Flare IQ, which does exactly what you're talking about, Susan, on mm -hmm. Flare uh, effectiveness. And then we, I personally have a continuous monitoring solution called Terrain which does that backend data analytics and it's actually pretty inexpensive. So we kind of cracked the code on that. So I, I'd get fired if I didn't say that. <laughs> and, this process, so. and I think it's really important to say too that these, these technologies are coming along very quickly now, just five years ago, this was a real obstacle. And, yeah, and we I are also uh, participating in, in Project Astra as well. Well, and somebody mentions, um, what is it, something, Project Canary. This is related to it too. Does anybody want to address that? Is this the same idea or? Yeah, Project, Project Canary is, is participating in Project Astra as well. Yeah. Yeah, they're another continuous monitoring solution, an IoT solution uh, based with, with yeah, ground-based sensors. And there's a, there's probably, I don't know, we're calling her Susan, you may know, it's, it's, a, it's a nascent, technology, it's not as developed as the fixed wing or satellite or, or OGI type work, but there's, and there's other technologies too. These sensors, there's other sensors that actually use lasers. So it's, it's really an exciting place to be in right now. Very nice. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I should have been picking my next question, but I got so interested in what you were saying. Um, well, I mean, this is, I think a lot of this is already going on, but it's a good question. Uh, so what are our thoughts on uh, alternatives in um, the takeaways? Uh, so electrical power, uh, re-injecting the methane for improved oil recovery, uh, on-site water treatment. Uh, so this, this might be a good one for Jennifer to start on. And I see Colin shaking his head. He's got some thoughts too. So can we look at that? Yeah, uh, very briefly, what, what, I, what I found and what I, what I learned is, 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 number one, if you make a commitment to sell your gas before you put your well online, then there's no need to explore those technologies. So that is, you know, Chevron said the best technology is, is not flaring at all. So that, so that's, that's one answer. And then the second answer, and I think Susan maybe alluded to it too, is that, that these technologies are, are fairly expensive and, and, and maybe not fit for purpose for, to scale across an entire basin based on geology, like, like Susan said, getting power, um, if your if your gas is very rich, you've got to process that gas on site before you can put it into a into a line that would serve power. So there are some barriers, I think, particularly financial barriers right now to employing these technologies. But I know some I know many producers, particularly the bigger ones, are really investigating investigating it right now as an alternative solution. Yeah, 
The only thing I'll add is <clears throat> I think that that question could be relevant to the current issues being discussed at the Capitol right now. I watched the hearings yesterday on the causes and solutions towards what we all experienced last week with the failure of the grid. And you know, you are we, we're seeing a situation develop where the generators and the producers are sort of blaming each other. Um, one of the things that's coming out is that the oil and gas producers are claiming that the loss of power in the field was, was a major reason why the gas supply wasn't able to maintain pressure, which was why the, some of the generators weren't able to generate. And so I wonder if this sort of question about what to do with, with associated gas in the Permian can't be tied into some sort of solution set for um, you know, powering, providing a little bit more of the electricity needs out into the in, out in the Permian Basin and, and creating a little bit more resiliency out there on the electricity side. We don't want the electricity to go away. It is lowering emissions on some of these things. We don't want compressor stations powered by gas because we know that those lead to higher emissions. It's better to have them powered by electricity. Same with no bleed pneumatics. Um, we want those powered not by gas anymore. So there may be a solution set that some of these on-site things that aren't necessarily scalable, maybe they can contribute to the resiliency discussion that's happening right now around our grid. It, and I agree. I think it's going to take, like, like I said before, it's going to take a whole ecosystem as a suite of systems. I, I don't think we're going to be able to get to a one size fits all. There's not going to be a, a one one particular technology. I think it's going to be more of a of a methodology and an idea of where you you go and you assess um, all of the different parameters of a site and what it it can sustain and not sustain in terms of, of different types of technology or pipeline infrastructure, or like uh, you know upgrading the gas if need be or treating it. And then you can, from there, look at suites of technologies that can work. But I think it's that planning that really needs to, to happen. Well, we are nearing the end of our uh, time. Uh, I want to ask one quick question because it's a it's a it's an important one, uh, and then I would uh, like to let each of you take a half a minute to just uh, add anything else you you want to um, say before we close. Uh, but just a quick question: uh, Does this venting release any H two S, any hydrogen sulfide, uh, into the atmosphere? That's a great question. It's one we've thought about looking at a little bit more. Um, we do think that the burning of the H2S is probably creating an SOX issue in the basin from a regional air pollution perspective. Um, but of course, H2S is very poisonous and, um, and there are pockets of the Permian that are very you know, rich in H2S. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want that gas escaping. And I would assume that, that there's, you know, if you have high emissions of methane, you probably have elevated emissions of H2S as well, but I don't have the data on that. Hmm. But, but it's not odorless okay. and you've got H2S. So uh, that helps us know that it's not hugely prevalent, but does anybody disagree? Yeah. Well, the, the kicker with H2S is that if it's, if it's, being emitted in large amounts, the one of the first things that it does is uh, destroys your sense of smell. <laughs> so you'll smell so you'll smell some really bad stuff uh, right up front, and and then you know then you're losing consciousness. So it, it's it's a gas we have to we have to take extra care with, and so uh, a, a lot of times you know they call it sweetening gas. You get sour gas fields. That's where you have H two S. And it's at those sweeteners where a lot of extra caution is taken. And usually, you know, from my experience, and I'm not an H2S expert, but it's it, most of that is removed, if not all of it's removed from the gas by the time it gets to the point where, you know, it's it's hitting a compressor station and and you know places where you might see that there's some flares. And at the wellhead, you know, there there might be some some issues there, but none that I've seen. Mm 
Well, we really must wrap up. We're actually, I, I, I made a mistake. I let us go past. Uh, so uh, real quick, starting with you, Jennifer, anything you want to say at the, it's kind of a closing. Uh, thank you very much. I would just like to say that the, that the, the science and technology and ease of use on, on monitoring of methane emissions, however, whatever technology you use, satellite, air, fixed wing, drone, continuous monitoring, is accelerating at an extremely rapid pace. And I think we're going to see the use of that more and more and more, um, both by voluntary actors who want to, who, to do the right thing, but despite what regulations tell them, and then also as regulatory, me regulatory measures are going to start requiring perhaps the use of either continuous monitoring or more frequent inspections or inspections of both new and existing sources under the federal regulations. So, it's, it's such an exciting space to be in and great to watch. And uh, Susan, you wanna add a little something at the end? Sure, just from my technology perspective, I just wanna remind a lot of folks that we're, not, we're no longer using just methane sensors. We have an entire instrument systems that we deploy to detect leaks. And in fact, the success of detecting and locating um, unintended emissions is no longer just about instrument performance, it's about the process or the methodology that we use for detection and how we utilize the instrument analytics, the algorithms, the data outputs to improve the probability that we can actually see those emissions being released. And so there's a lot, a lot more to come in that space. I'll, I'll end on a, sorry, I'll end on a positive note on the policy side. We are seeing some movement in Texas on flaring. Uh, the Railroad Commission has, it's got the attention of the Railroad Commission. They have made some, uh, some modest changes to their flaring regulations. And we just saw recently the Texas Methane and Flaring Coalition, which is an industry trade group, come out in support of ending routine flaring by 2030. I have some criticisms of that. Uh, but I do think it shows um, momentum, and I think we should maintain that and keep pushing forward. So I think uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Ramanan, um, and he's going to tell me that we had a word from our sponsor that we just missed. No, no, no we don't have a sponsor, but thank <laughs> you so much, Christine. That was just a terrific conversation. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Susan, and Colin, really thank you for participating in this. Uh, this was a very lively conversation. I think really timely in terms of uh, all the issues that we've been considering about natural gas. Um, or, again, I want to thank uh, Christine as well as my colleagues here at UH Energy for helping put this together. Uh, uh, Lauren Kibler, uh, Carl Kinder, and Iggy, uh, for all their help in making sure that this happens. I want to invite you back for our next one, which is on March 25th, and that is on robotics and automation in the energy world. Uh, and this is really a fast moving area, uh, much like uh, what we've seen with natural gas flaring and venting. Uh, uh, robotics and, uh, and automation uh, is really taking rapid steps in taking people out of the risk uh, and hazardous situation. And we'll have a terrific panel for that on the 25th of March. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please do feel free to send us questions, comments, uh, and, uh, and PDH requests if you so desire. Thank you so much again, and uh, we'll see you back in a month's time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>